A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to a special episode of True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Everyone in the world of true crime has a story to tell about a case they worked or lived through. Some are high profile, some you've never heard of, but they are all fascinating. Today's case is about a gruesome double murder that happened almost 100 years ago in New Brunswick, New Jersey, when the town's minister and a choir singer were found shot to death, it shocked not only the small town, but really the nation. Dark secrets quickly came to light after it became known that the married minister and the housewife were having an affair. With us today is Joe Pompeo, senior media correspondent for Vanity Fair, who previously worked at Politico and the New York Observer. Joe recently wrote a book called Blood and Ink, the scandalous jazz age double murder that hooked America on true crime. He spent years researching this case. The New York Times says it is an addictive whodunit that leaves us wanting more. Joe, welcome to the program. How are you? I'm good. Happy to be here. Oh, we're, we're thrilled to have you. you. You elevate the real estate, as I say, when we have <laughs> such distinguished guests as you. So, you know, there are tons of murders involving, you know, over, you know, as old as time as people have been having affairs. Um, As I always say, these love triangles never end well. So what is it that drew you to this particular murder? I mean, part of it was just the fact that it it took place in, in New Jersey, where I've lived all my life, and specifically in New Brunswick, New Jersey, where I went to college. I went to Rutgers. Um, but I had never heard of this story back then, even though it's such a part of the lore um, of that town and, and probably of central New Jersey and, and New Jersey in general. But really, as you as you as you point out, like all the the swirl of elements here, you know, there's um, there is murder, there's sex, there's scandal. There are people with a lot of money behaving badly, um, you know, a, a, a really wild cast of eccentric characters um, and a really bewildering puzzling case in, in every way that dragged on for, you know, four years and ultimately became, you know, a media spectacle like America had never seen. So I, it's, you know, aside from the, both the local interest in this, that was sort of had a personal residence for me um, and just the contours of, of the case itself. And I, I found it, you know, an irresistible uh, story to research and write. Absolutely. I, I used to be a reporter in New Jersey. I'm surprised that they didn't blame the Jersey devil on this one. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a, uh, I think in New Jersey, there's so many, um, there's so much like weird lore, and and I think that this this fits nicely in with that with that long proud tradition the state the state has. Absolutely, and one of my the Garden State is one of my favorites. I always said, you know, in three hours you could drive drive from one end to the other, and you could have mountains, cranberry bogs, beaches, urban areas. It's it's one of my favorite states ever. But this is a perfect crime for New Jersey. <laughs> All right, so just some very basic facts so you all can follow along, and then Joe's going to give us all the juicy details. On September 16th of 1922, the bodies of a man and woman were found next to each other uh, on this abandoned farm, carefully arranged under a a crabapple tree. You know, it it just sounds like an old Hollywood movie, right? That Mm -hmm. kind of a tree. Um, This happened in New Brunswick, as you said, and at the time that was a small manufacturing university town, um, you know, kind of a quiet place. So here are the victims. We have the dead man is Reverend Edward Hall, a popular Episcopal minister whose wife came from a very wealthy family. And then the woman who was murdered was Eleanor Mills, an unhappily married, not so rich housewife who sang in the choir at Reverend Hall's church. And Eleanor's husband was the parish custodian to the church. Let's talk about the arrangement. This this is part of why this is so intriguing. The bodies were staged. How mm-hmm. were they staged? Why why was that so interesting and what was put around them? So they were it was as if they were, you know, kind of like sleeping or, or snoozing next to, next to one another and in fact the young couple that found the body that's what they uh the, the girl at least suspected at first um but if you you know upon closer look it was two dead bodies that were positioned side by side. Uh, Edward's arm, Reverend Hall's arm, his right arm was outstretched and her her head was like resting on his arm as if they were kind of in a, you know, a, an affectionate sort of pose. 
uh, along the same vein. Her left hand was resting upon his his thigh. Their clothing was, you know, despite this sort of gruesome killing, their clothing was very neat. Everything was 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 crisp and and laid very neat. Um, and you know, between their bodies, there was a stack of papers. These turned out to be their uh, love letters. Uh, near there were some other affects, you know, personal affects scattered around the bodies. But the other really intriguing detail uh, near Edward's foot had been placed his his calling card. You know, back in the day, you know, calling card had your name on it. And when you went to someone's house, you'd give it to them so they knew who was coming to see you. So you know, it, and it was in you know printed in this bold Gothic text. Um, befitting, uh, you know, the olden days. And, you know, it was as if whoever found the bodies, it was, it was as if they were meant to know right away who this was. Um, and there were some other, you know, kind of intriguing details, you know, his, his glasses were still on, but over his face, someone had placed his Panama hat, like over his eyes. She had a, you know, brown scarf around her neck. And when it was removed, it was revealed that there was this deep gash in her neck that was filled with maggots that were sort of creeping up her face. And, you know, there's also maggots on, on his face as well. So it was quite a gruesome sight, but it was also this this kind of artful. Um, one, one of the reporters who was one of the first in the scene, you know, he 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 had later said that he he was he wrote in his story that it was as though they were peacefully at rest. And they, and they struck that language because obviously this, this had been a brutal killing, but um, you know, it was almost as if like a mortician, you know, one of the one of the police officers in the scene thought it looked like a mortician had laid these these bodies out. So, you know, it was a crime scene with a lot of thought and care that had been put into it. But it it feels very um, violent and deliberate in the sense that um, who was wounded even more than the other, mm -hmm. which I find physically, in, you know, physically, I find that interesting. And the fact that the love letters were placed there, this to me shows a lot of anger. And I think we know clearly based on that, I would say that would be the motive. Their affair had something to do with this. Yeah. And as you point out, she was, there was more violence committed on, on Eleanor, the woman, you know, uh, Reverend Hall had been shot once in his face. She had three, you know, she died from three bullet wounds to the face. Um, any one of them probably would have killed her. And then, you know, it's believed the neck was cut post-mortem. And, you know, this was a, uh, you know, a singer, a beautiful, she had a beautiful soprano voice. She was the star of the church choir. And I think, you know, um, people read some symbolism in that. This is, you know, this is striking right at her, at her voice, <laughs> essentially after she was already dead. But, you know, there, there you could read that as a symbolic sort of act of violence, you know, cutting at, at her throat, but clearly there was a disproportionate amount of, you know, uh, violence that was inflicted on on Eleanor, which I do think suggests, you know, anger or vengeance. Intimacy certainly is also maybe suggested here. Someone who yeah. who knew what was going on, who knew these people, who, you know, very deliberately, as you know, placed these these love letters uh, between them. These were all, I think. You know, I think this is what made it such a sensation from day one, you know, for for the newspapers, you know, philandering minister with his married working class homemaker, choir singer um, in this completely bewildering crime scene. I mean, this has had the makings of a newspaper sensation. I'm curious about the love letters. Were they um, all like from one to the other? Was it a mixture of the two? How long had this affair been going on? So the love letters that were found at the scene, those were all from Eleanor to Edward. Mm. So I guess if, if if that's all that had ever come out were these love letters, maybe you could assume this is an unrequited romantic obsession or something of that sort. But, you know, as it turns out and as it, you know, quickly begins, becomes clear from the newspaper coverage, which is, you know, getting all sorts of leaks from the investigation and all sorts of gossip that's that's being starting to fly around town. This was an affair that pretty much everyone knew about. They had been you know, it, it wasn't, it was, it was a secret, but it was kind of like, you know, an open, essentially an open secret. You know, a lot of people within the church, within the choir, you know, were sort of very aware something was going on. They, you know, Edward and Eleanor had been spotted in, in different places, New York city or down the Jersey shore. Um, and later on, you know, as the case unfolds, his letters to her are, are found too. So, so, Edward's letters to, to Eleanor do surface and also a diary that he kept from her uh, just three weeks earlier. He had been on vacation with with his wife, Frances Hall, this you know, illustrious um, heiress. They were in Maine 
And at this time that Edward and Eleanor were apart, they agreed to keep secret love diaries for one another. So every night he would write to her, he would write like love letters, but it was in this diary. Um, Eleanor's diary was never found, uh, but I looked through the reverends as well. And, you know, these were steamy missives. They were also missives that conveyed a certain like religious fervor, a lot of passion, um, you know, and, and, and a, a love affair. I mean, it, it seems that reading these, you would, you would, you would deduce that these were two people that were in a very strong romantic entanglement. Um, and that had been going on for, you know, at least several years leading up to their deaths. And it's really no different from what we see now with emails, text messages, sexting, all of these things. I mean, we generally find everything in a much more um, a digital way uh, than the old fashioned letters and diary. Just so fascinating that they would keep this documented and they weren't afraid of people finding this stuff. There, you know, there was some brazenness to it. I mean, some of the love letters that came out that they had uh, certain places in the church. Uh, it was said that they had a certain, they would sometimes leave them in hymnals. There was a certain book on one of the shelves in Edward's study at the church that was known to be like their their post office where um, even Eleanor's daughter, you know, said that, that she knew that they, they put le le exchange letters in this in this book of his. But even when he was on vacation, you know, he would send some letters directly to the house, you know, addressed to Eleanor, but, you know, that could have been opened by her husband, Jim, you know, and they weren't quite maybe as steamy as the as the the diary or some of their secret letters, but it it, it does make you question, you know, whether the the two spurned spouses were as ignorant of this affair as they as they claimed, because to some extent there was a sort of brazenness about it. Yeah, it's kind of hard to believe given um, that level of communication, especially at that time and even when they're away. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, Reverend Hall's wife? Because she came from a, a great deal of money, and that's important. That would be Francis Stevens Hall. Yeah, just first with the money, Francis Stevens Hall. It was reported in the New York Times early on that she was said to be have a uh, an inheritance worth $1.7 million dollars, which is tens of millions of dollars today, you know, to be thorough here, she would, she would later deny that she ever had that much money. She later claimed she was only ever worth 300,000, but that's kind of like the amount that set the tone. In either case, she was, you know, she was an heiress. She was very wealthy. They had a lot of money. They lived in this uh, beautiful uh, Victorian mansion kind of just up the hill from the Mills family who lived in this kind of ramshackle apartment just a few blocks away. Um, but her, she comes from a very proud lineage of ancestors who, who, you know, go all the way back to revolutionary colonial times. She had uh, a great grandfather named Ebenezer Stevens, who, uh, you know, was at the, um, you know, was a figure in the revolutionary war and, you know, hurled tea into the Harbor in, in Boston and, you know, corresponded after the war with some of the founding fathers. I saw some letters that he had you know, exchanged with with Jefferson and, and Madison. Um, and, you know, he had two wives and through another wife, uh, his, his second wife, after the first had died, he had this other lineage. And one of the descendants from that line was none other, none other than Edith Wharton. So this was a very yeah. illustrious family with um, these, you know, uh, proud ancestors. And even on, and on the other side of Francis's family, that's on her um, father's side, her mother's side, uh, which was the Carpenter family. This was uh, a you know prominent businessman that had established, established themselves in New York. One of her uncles had become this successful entrepreneur in New Brunswick. He had this wallpaper company that made a lot of money and then eventually leased its headquarters to Johnson & Johnson, which was just getting started at the time, yeah. but became you know a, a huge international conglomerate that's still headquartered in, in, in New Brunswick. Um, and the Carpenter family, they all lived in New Brunswick. She had a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles, and they all lived in these, you know, fancy homes in this leafy enclave in the in sort of the rich, uh, the rich side of, of town. So they were almost like, you know, the Boston Brahmins or something like that of, of New Brunswick. You know, this and this was their sort of enclave, along with some other prominent, you know, families that also had similar, similar backgrounds. So you had this dichotomy uh, between the Mills family, which is a little bit down the hill, who lived in this poor section. Up the hill, you have Francis Stevens Hall and her rich carpenter um, relatives. And these two worlds kind of collided in uh, at the church, St. John the Evangelist, where Edward was minister and where, where Eleanor sang in the choir.
So I presume back then, just as we do now, you generally, most people are killed by people that they know. And oftentimes in a situation like this, you're always looking at the significant others. So I would presume that the spouses of the two murder victims were looked at pretty closely, or maybe they weren't. Well, they do look at them, you know, early on, the first person they really start to grill is Jim Mills. And he is, you know, the cuckold did widow. Obviously, there's a, a motive there. Um, and they they start interrogating him right away, right after, you know, he learns that, you know, his wife's been murdered. And, you know, he, as you had pointed out in the in the intro, his his marriage with with Eleanor was, you know, had pretty much broken down some years earlier. They they fought a lot. It was not a really a happy home. She was very um cold and 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 sarcastic with him a lot of the time. In fact, the night she disappeared, he was out on the on the on their their porch and he was working on some some uh, some wooden boxes he was putting together. And he said, where are you going? And, and her last words to him were follow me and find out. And this really like biting uh, sort of sarcastic reply. Um, so for a few days, his wife, his wife is gone. And he finally starts looking for her um, in earnest, like on the on the Saturday. And the cops, you know, eventually they tell him his wife's dead and he's sort of shocked, but they start questioning him right away. They don't go and question Francis right away. There's sort of deference to this wealthy woman who they thought, it, you know, let's give her a day to compose herself and and mourn. But Jim, he had a decent alibi from the beginning. Um, you know, he was seen uh, around 9 p.m. at the home. His his daughter and son came home around 10, 15, 10, 30. They, they, they said they saw him in the house then. He was seen purchasing a soda water around the corner at some general store around like 11. So in the time that the murders were believed to have been committed, which would have been sometime between, you know, 10, maybe, you know, the earliest 930, the latest 11, but probably somewhere in the 1030 realm, you know, it's possible he could have huffed it out to this farm a few miles away and gotten back. But there were people who saw him in this time frame. And that seemed like a pretty decent alibi to the authorities. Now, Francis... Uh, when they do talk to her the next day, they had this tip from a couple of neighbors of hers who said, you know, we saw something strange on, you know, early uh, Friday morning in the middle of the night around 2.33 a.m. in the morning. We saw some woman, you know, kind of uh, in a gray coat, uh, you know, sneaking into the the, the hall mansion um, and they confront her with this. She said, oh, that well, that was me. And she says, you know, I was so distraught. Uh, my husband hadn't been home. Um, you know, he left the house at 730 and, you know, he just didn't return and she was beside herself. So she summoned her brother who lived with them in the house, Willie Stevens, um, from his room. And they went down to look for Edward at the church. And that's why she was seen coming back late at night. We don't know why Willie wasn't seen going in with her, but she has an, you know, she has an, a story right away. And mm -hmm. they, they say they had nothing to do with this and that that was their story that they were in the house all night until she woke up Willie and they walked down to the church. And, you know, I think there's an element of, you know, how hard are you going to push with this, you know, prominent um, woman who's very well connected in in town and in, in New Jersey in general, to an extent. Um, and they did sort of euphemistically question her about, you know, the, the affair. They said, you know, were you aware of, I think what they said was the intimate friendship between your husband and Mrs. Mills. And she said, I'm not, I'm not, you know, aware that there, that there was an intimate friendship, you know, that there was anything, uh, you know, untoward about, or anything unique at all about their, their friendship. They were, they were close as, um, you know, within the church as, as the minister and this very devoted church woman who sang in the choir and, and Francis and Jim, both from the, from the get go, pretty much denied that they had could imagine any reason why, their spouses were together other than to discuss some sort of church business or official business. And the official excuse that um, Edward had given when he was leaving the house that Thursday night, Eleanor had called him on the phone and the the halls had lent them some money for an operation she needed to have. Mm -hmm. um, and she had some question about the bill and she needed his assistance. That was kind of the official yeah, story. Yeah, 930 at night. Yeah. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally innocent. So, of course, you know, like they're, they were, you know, um, you know, making it seem like, you know, we can't imagine why, unless there was a very good reason for them to be meeting at this time, why they would be out together, you know. So the fact that 
um, Frances Stevens Hall came from such a prominent family and she had power. And we all know, because this is still true today, that that can have an effect on an investigation and the direction in which it goes. Did you uncover anything that showed how the investigation may have been swayed and any evidence that either was or wasn't gathered because of it? Well, there's, there are you know, insinuations and accusations that come out later that suggest that this family you know, was maybe um, you know, bribing officials to lay off or this and that. There's nothing that's concrete that proves that, but Frances did hire her own private investigator fairly early on. She had a, you know, kind of a powerful New York attorney who came down to represent her, but also was sort of just her kind of like her PR guy too, to an extent. He was sort of her main handler and he retains this, this detective named Felix Demartini, who's a former, there's, there's great names in the story too, Felix Demartini. Um, and he had been with the uh, NYPD, he'd been a detective and he was in private practice now. And he's this sort of like slippery character that starts to appear in New Brunswick. And there's questions about why does she have this private eye? And she claims it's because they're just trying to investigate who killed her husband. But there's a lot of you know, things to suggest that, you know, he, this private eye was more for like, you know, oppo research and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of maybe later on, there's some, you know, allegations that he was maybe intimidating witnesses, but it's all to an extent, it's all to an extent, you know, circumstantial and, 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 and insinuated. Um, but, but certainly, you know, I think that the authorities at first, they definitely didn't go too hard at Francis Hall, which I think says something. They took mm -hmm. her at her word and, you know, the first time that they really, you know, put someone in, in the hot seat about this, it was nothing to do with either of the of the of the spouses. They kind of they went back to the two kids who found the bodies. I say kids. One was the guy was 23. The girl was 15. Mm -hmm. And they were they were fooling around, um, you know, which is, you know, we'll note that age difference and how that would not be appropriate today. <laughs> but um, and under the tree, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> this yeah. is a so makeout were, location. <laughs> So this, so their names were Pearl Bomber and Ray Schneider. They're the people with who this book begins, and they find the bodies when they are also out in the morning on this on this notorious lovers' lane on this abandoned farm. Um, and the detectives go back to them, and they go really hard at Ray. He was sort of this like ne'er do well, uh, you know, character. Um, couldn't hold down a job. He was estranged from his wife, and you know, but one of the things that was really interesting about the crime scene too is that Edward's watch. He had a gold watch that was missing. It was never found. Um, it hadn't turned up in, in any pawn shops either. And, you know, they thought maybe Ray had stolen it. Maybe he knew more about this than he let on. So they, they hauled in him and one of his friends that he was out gallivanting with that same night of the murders and mm -hmm. basically gave him the third degree, you know, 24 hours of like intense questioning and sleep deprivation. And Ray finally cracks and comes out with this story that his friend had a gun with him and they were, they were following Pearl and her father and they followed them all the way to this, this field. And it's really convoluted, like ridiculous story and his friend whose name was Clifford Hayes pulls out his gun and shoots who he thinks are you know raised girl young girlfriend Pearl and her and her father but lo and behold it's actually Francis and it's actually Edward and and Eleanor and they run away and so that was the story with which they railroad this this innocent guy Cliff Clifford Hayes who's been accused by his friend of being the murderer and they're kind of like well we've solved you know we've solved it but no one believes it you know but I think the fact that the authorities just to try to like, you know, make this thing go away. We're willing to railroad this, you know, like working class kid instead of really pursuing more uh, thoroughly, you know, the Hall family, the Stevens Hall Stevens Carpenter clan. So was he to that. was he charged and and, and he brought was to trial? Yeah, not brought to trial, but he was he was he was charged and uh, with the murder, and no one believed it. I mean, the, the report, the journalists, the press didn't believe it. The townspeople didn't believe it. There was a big outcry in town. Like there's, this is just makes no sense. Um, and eventually a detective, the main detective in the case, he's, you know, he goes to the prosecutor. He's like, we got to like put an end to this charade. And, you know, he goes and re-questions re re Ray Schneider and gets him to, to admit, admit he made the whole thing up because he was, you know, he had just cracked under the pressure. But this is also very important that this, this happened because the fact that the newspapers were covering this, this, this poor New Brunswick boy who's been, you know, railroaded, um, that led to the woman who would become the star witness of the trial coming forward uh, in the investigation. So it was sort of, you know, in the tick top 
of how things played out, it was sort of a key moment. So after the charges are dropped against him, where is the case? Is it just cold and done? It's it's not cold and done. Um, you know, simultaneously, this woman comes forward quietly and it's not reported in the newspapers, you know, for a few weeks. But she emerges with this story. She goes to this detective, George Totten, who she knew somehow and tells him, I know that that Hayes boy didn't do it because I was a witness to the murders. Uh, this woman's name was Jane Gibson. She she lived on a farm that was sort of up the road from where, where the murders had taken place. And she was a very theatrical, sort of pioneering farm woman. Specifically, she raised pigs, hogs on her farm. So she was a, a pig farmer. She also raised corn. Um, but once the newspapers got wind of her, this, this kind of mystery witness who had emerged with this supposed eyewitness tale of the murder night they 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 found out who she was and the fact that she was this like kind of wild wacky pig farmer from up the road was just a great copy for them and they called her the pig woman that became sort of her pejorative moniker throughout the rest of the case but her story um which is also rather fantastical was that she had been roused you know around sometime between 9 30 and 10 at night by the barking of a dog and she thought someone was stealing some of her corn and she saw a wagon in the distance and she's like, that must be the thief. So she gets on a mule, this, this mule of hers named Jenny, it's her favorite mule. And she, she goes on this moonlight mule ride pursuing this putative corn thief in a wagon, you know, up Derusi's lane, which is, which is the, the name of this road that was sort of the, the lover's lane that led to the, the farm where the, where the murders took place. And she loses sight of the wagon, but at some point, you know, she happens upon the murder scene in the darkness. And, you know, she has one key detail in there that really raises their eyebrows, which is that she heard these gunshots and she also heard a woman cry out, oh, Henry. And, you know, Francis's other brother, aside from Willie, who lived with her, was a guy named Will, uh, Henry Stevens. So that was sort of, uh, of of interest to the authorities. And they immediately begin to look more closely at Francis and her brother's based on this this new development they have from the pig woman. So Jane Gibson then, was her story accurate? Did, was was this truthful? That's, I mean, that's one of the questions that is open to this day. But, you know, the thing about her story was that she kept changing it. You know, she, she had different versions of the story. And once she, the newspapers started talking to her, I mean, she was just like, you know, like she would she would tell different versions of the story one day and different version the next. And it conflicted in some details with the t- story she originally told the police. But the outline was always the same, you know, in some versions she had actually seen, you know, a man dragging, you know, Eleanor out of the bushes. And she, you know, claimed, um, you know, at various times that she was able to, you know, make identifications or or this or that. But I think that the deep, the O Henry detail was sort of the key and the detectives, they, you know, went with her and they reconstructed her, the ride at the exact time of night, it would have occurred. And they made her tell the thing, you know, as they were going along and they believed it. And the special prosecutor who was brought in to, to try the case, he also said he believed it. They put really all of their eggs in this basket because it was the only thing they had really. I mean, there was lots of gossip and intrigue and other, you know, kind of intriguing whispers that were that were useful to them. And one of those is, is that they had some people in the church that were believed to have been kind of spies for Francis Hall that knew about the affair, that had intercepted the love letters and passed them to Francis on the night of the, uh, you know, the, the, the day of the murders. Um, so there was other, you know, a lots of like intriguing leads and things like that. But really, it came down to this, the Jane Gibson and her and her story. So at this point, so I can have a a time frame, uh, the murders have happened. And so at this point, you know, there's uh, someone who's arrested and then like, oh, bad confession. Now what happens in the case? How far along are we? Are we like years down the road when this happens? No, we're into like mid-October. Oh, okay. Um, So we're, you know, we're, we're getting to over a month with really no major developments. Um, And we should also note that the, the authorities in such a horrible job at the outset, like securing the crime scene. I mean, it was just like a forensic travesty. You know, there was hordes of people had descended very quickly on this farm and they didn't hold them back and they were rifling through evidence. They didn't take photos. There were no proper autopsies done at at first. They had to later exhume the bodies to do an actual autopsy and they didn't have a good reason as to why they didn't do an official autopsy. So they had this completely ham-fisted 
investigation. And by mid-October, they were under such pressure, both from the newspapers, both from the public and from the governor of New Jersey himself, who had like dragged the, the, these two prosecutors in because the case had <laughs> occurred sort of over the county line. So like yep. it was there was two different right counties Trump, yeah. that were sort of involved. And um, and they're like, you, I wanted an arrest yesterday. So that's why they kind of like are going with whatever comes their way. <laughs> you know, first it's this this poor kid with this you know ridiculous story. And then it's the pig woman. Um, but then from that point, they start to really probe Francis and her brothers. And, you know, they start to take a closer look at them. So by November, there's enough the special prosecutor has to call a grand jury. And that's when um, there's a five day grand jury inquiry in November into um, in, in, into the murders. And so then is someone finally charged and put on trial? No. So the grand jury. <laughs> I love Jersey. It, <laughs> the grand jury itself is somewhat of a charade. You know, some of the things that they were expected to really hit on during these proceedings. So, for instance, these two, um, there's these two characters. They were also members of the church. Their names were one was named Ralph Gorsline. And another was named Minnie Clark. And these were believed to be these like sort of gossipy busybodies who knew about what was going on, who each had some jealousy over Eleanor Minnie because she was kind of like a rival in, you know, her, her position within the church as this, you know, uh, very important person within the church who was, had very close proximity to Reverend Hall. And Ralph Gorsline was rumored to have had, you know, his own you know, romant romantic attachment to, to Eleanor and had been rebuffed and was maybe jealous. So there's these two people that everyone, there's all these whispers and things coming out in the newspapers that suggest that, that these two people know more than they're letting on. Um, and indeed, Ralph Gorsline, Ralph Gorsline was dogged by these, this account that uh, he had been coincidentally at the lover's lane when the murders occurred. How this, many people were yeah. under this tree? I exactly. mean, this is, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah, so was there was this persistent story that a man from the church who was married <laughs> and another and a, who was, was out joyriding with a woman from the church choir who was not his wife. Her name was Catherine Rastall and that they had been in, in his car and heard the gunshots. And, you know, he, he, he they deny this at the time. And he's barely really even I mean, he just at, at the grand jury. He just says, I have no idea about any affair. I have no idea what you're talking about. He just kind of, it's like pulling teeth, trying to get him to admit that, you know, he even knew anything. So that's a dud. And then Minnie Clark, the, the woman who's believed to be like Francis's spy that, you know, they believe that she intercepted the love letters and given to, there's all this stuff coming out in the papers, you know, this really juicy material. And so the press was expecting them to like grill her about that. And she comes out like five minutes later, they barely asked her a question and everyone's kind of shocked. So they really, all they have, that's that's of material value is is the witness is the testimony of this sort of wacky woman who might not be the most credible witness and indeed um her testimony is basically a, a disaster you know she trips up she can't admit whether she saw you know henry stevens or a different man it's it's just and and the prosecutor too he at times he's just like either you know either because he just realizes the case is a wash and doesn't care anymore or because maybe there was some influence that, you know, was, you know, having these people not press too hard. He, he's almost like interrogating Jane Gibson as if he's working for the defense. You know, he's kind of like undermining his own witness because she's just so she's just so bad on the stand. So, um, Joe, at what point does someone finally get charged here? Does anybody get charged? So it goes away. 1922, no indictments. The whole thing goes away, but, you know, unsolved. So this is now unsolved. But this is where like the other thread of my book comes into play in, in an important way. And that's the story about the birth of the tabloid newspapers in New York. Mm -hmm. So there was one of them in 1922 called da the news, the New York Daily News. It was the first tabloid in America. And it was a, a type of newspaper that was, you know, uh, just completely suited to this sort of, you know, lurid scandal, murder, sex type of story. So, it, you know, it's covering the case and its editor after the case went cold, um, he decided, you know, I, let's let's try to bring this thing back. And he takes a closer look at Jim Mills, the the the, the widow, the brother, the widow's brother, El Ele Eleanor's husband. The, oh, um, Eleanor's husband. Widow, sorry, sorry, the, the widower. He takes a look at the widower, Jim Mills. Okay. And you know, the, the the Daily News, they knew that if they could like get a break in this case, it would be huge for them. It would be great for their circulation. 
and they you know they lured jim who it came out was you know believed in ghosts and he was kind of one of a convert to the spiritualism revival that was going out going on at the time and in early 1923 they they create this they stage this fake séance and they lure jim to this you know fake fortune teller's lair in manhattan and they <laughs> accuse accuse him of killing his wife and try to break him but he doesn't he he you know he he didn't do it and it's you know for the next couple of years as other tabloids were came onto the scene in new york first you had the daily news then you had the new york daily mirror which is a hearst paper you had the a third tabloid called the new york evening graphic mm -hmm. um and they all had a, you know they had an idea that you know if they could bring back the hall mills case that it would be this huge success so the the, the daily news tries in 1923 doesn't succeed the new york evening graphic they take a stab at it in 1924 and they send uh, a reporter down to New Brunswick to reinterview the pig woman and he's you know getting all this stuff and he they want to put this story on the front page of their debut issue you know they, and, and blow it up and it would be you know huge thing for them but at the, at the 11th hour the boss is kind of like you know this this is this is I don't think we have the story here so that goes away but meanwhile Phil Payne the editor of the Daily News who had orchestrated this fake séance he gets fired and then Hearst hires him to run the Daily Mirror so now he's he's the boss of this new rival tabloid he's out for blood he wants to like you know stick it to the daily news he knows the graphic had been on the trail of like reinvestigating the case and he decides well, we're going to take a stab at it now this is now 1925 so phil payne the editor of the daily mirror in this essentially what's new york's first tabloid war sends a reporter down to new brunswick once again and they do this this eight-month newspaper investigation and that's ultimately how in 1926 this case comes roaring back to life Okay, so 1926, and the murders Four years occurred, later. Yeah. occurred in 22. So, is there a trial, or is there just, you yeah, know, so, so tabloid Payne, chatter? It's a lot of tabloid chatter, but they do have new bits of evidence. A lot of it is circumstantial, but they have a couple of things that are very compelling. One is a statement from this guy who had married a maid in the Hall household. Uh, she had married a woman named Louise Geist. She was present the night of the murders in the home. She answered the phone call that was, you know, Eleanor summoning Edward to talk about this confusing medical bill. Um, and this guy had married her and he claimed that his, his now estranged wife had, you know, told him that she in fact had accompanied Francis and her brothers to the murder scene so that would the be murders. the reverend's wife because there's so wife. many characters yeah. you've brought in. Okay. So, so right now you have someone who's working as what a maid in the house Maid in the house. Okay. According to her estranged husband, four years later, he claims that she, she confessed to him that she had gone to the murder scene with Francis Hall and her brothers and also their chauffeur, this guy named Peter Tumulty and that they were there when the murders took place and that she suggested strongly to him that they had been bribed to keep it to keep it quiet and he puts this all in a in a in a, an annulment petition that he wanted to annul his marriage oh so it's in the court record oh i it's love in the court that record but it's also like that you know he goes with the daily mirror they take him to the notary public and they you know take down the statement with mirror reporters present and then it very quickly disappears from the court record somehow you know so oh. there's clearly um the mirror is, is able to pull strings here but that's one thing they have they've also have the calling card the calling card that was at the reverend's foot that, that i mentioned when i was talking mm -hmm. about the crime scene they have found the original calling card with a fingerprint expert who had taken possession of it at the time and they have looked at the card and it is claimed that a fingerprint on the card matches the fingerprint of francis's brother willie stevens so these are who kind of lives like a, in the house who lives in the reverend house. hall and his wife yes and then there is the maid Okay, these this yeah. is the rich family. Okay. It's hard to boil this down in a podcast episode. It's such a complex uh, Yeah, I know that. You like <laughs> story, you need a whole but... serial podcast thing going on here. Um <laughs> So that's the main evidence they have. And you know, they bring it straight to the governor of New Jersey, who Phil Payne had these connections with, and the New Jersey authorities who were, you know, part of like the democratic machine at the time. So there's, you know, an element of like party bossery and and that they they reopen the case and they basically the state basically kind of takes over and they, they reopen the case and they eventually they do arrest Francis and her two brothers and a cousin of theirs who was implicated in this whole thing as well. So the and widow is arrested and her widow. brothers and a, and a cousin are all arrested. They're charged with murder. Yes. And, the and cousin, they're all I don't put wanna, on trial. 
I don't want to make it too confusing, but the cousin was also named Henry. So this key detail, the O Henry ah. becomes, <laughs> becomes, it becomes germane. Three of them are put on trial. The cousin, they decide to try separately, mm -hmm. but the first three defendants to be tried are going to be Francis Hall, the, the widow, Willie Stevens, her brother who lived with them in the house and Henry Stevens, her other brother who lived down the Jersey shore. And, you know, this is where things are at by November, 1926, when there actually is a trial and a huge trial. That's a, complete Oh, this is scandalous. Spectacle. I mean, to have, you know, um, you know, people of means, um, society people at a trial charged with murder. I mean, that's, that's really something. I mean, you had about 200 to 300 reporters from all over the country. They descend on small town, Somerville, New Jersey. That was the the county seat of Somerset County, which is where the murders actually occurred. Oh, okay. And they have all these reporters just, they they book up entire homes, they fill the hotels. It's a complete- Nothing has changed. It's circus. the same thing now. I mean- It's, it's, it's OJ Simpson, but all in 19, 1926, essentially. Um, and some, you know, and some some stars too, like star reporters like Dave, Damon Runyon came and covered the trial. They had some celebrity mystery, mystery writers that sort of parachute in, but it's a complete, a complete national spectacle. Um, and- you know, despite, you know, the new evidence of like this allegation that the maid had been, you know, seen the whole thing and been paid off, they don't, they, they kind of put that aside. Once again, the special prosecutor who's called in, you know, to, to try this case goes back to who else? The pig woman, Jane Gibson. She again becomes the key, the key piece of their defense. And they, and they say they believe her story. They believe despite, you know, all the questions about her credibility as a witness and all these things that have come out about her that suggest she's a liar and, can't be trusted. And they still basically hang the case half on the calling card, but mostly on Jane Gibson's testimony. And so I want to be clear, the fingerprint matched who? Willie Stevens. Her brother. The, the brother. The it, widow's it, had, br it had five what they called ridge characteristics that fingerprint experts testified they believed match the fingerprint of, right. of Willie Stevens. And okay. again, maybe, maybe Willie handled the calling card, you know, some other time he lived with the guy. Right. Maybe, maybe the Daily Mirror had corrupted it along the way. And there's, there was a question about the provenance of the card, which had been found by the Daily Mirror, which was the ones who had were very incentivized to bring this whole thing back and claim all this, this glory. Um, so that's the calling card. But, but again, it's really Jane Gibson that becomes the star of, of the trial. And I think why it was so dramatic. So what did the jury decide? So they, there's two jurors that are very convinced by the fingerprint evidence on the card. All of them unanimously think that Jane Gibson's full of it and they no one believes her her story. So that that's kind of a flop for them. Okay. But these these two holdouts that that were con that were swayed by the card, the other jurors convinced them otherwise and um they return uh they the all three defendants are acquitted. Not guilty. Not guilty. So it's a huge black eye to the mirror. You know, they were like, you know, we've solved this thing and they get they end up getting sued by by the family um, for libel. And, you know, the whole thing kind of goes away again or so it seems because there will later be, you know, another development, another another twist in this already very complicated mystery. This is actually my favorite part of the story. <laughs> I'm glad because it's, it's, you don't see it coming. No, no, you don't. You don't. So so what is the 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 simplest way to explain what happens? So so when this next incident happens, this this turn, when when is it and what happens? Yeah. Fast forward to 1969. I'll try to be as brief as, as succinct as possible with <laughs> this. An old guy from New Brunswick who thinks he's on his deathbed in the in a hospital that's right near you know where the uh, the scene of where the murders took place he has this crisis of conscience because he was a friend of Willie Stevens he has this piece of information that links Willie to the murders and he calls the police department from his what he thinks is his deathbed and says I can help you solve the Hall Mills murder case of you know 47 years earlier um and they and a detective actually goes and reinvestigates the case based on this guy's story, mm -hmm. parts of which he's able to, the detective's able to corroborate. Um, so it's a really fascinating, like out of nowhere, left field kind of development from this old man who, who doesn't die, obviously. He, 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 he survives what he was in the hospital for. Um, and they do a whole nother investigation and kind of go, they, they, they go and, and, and retrace, you know, all Well, what the, does he say? What is his information? What does he say? So Willie Stevens, he says, always hated Reverend Hall because Reverend Hall controlled Willie's 
allowance. Willie was an eccentric guy. He was sort of childlike in a lot of ways, but also very smart. Um, it, you know, I think a modern interpretation of, of his of his um, psychology might suggest he was somewhere on the autism spectrum. Um, and he's someone that he, the family couldn't trust him to, to manage his own affairs. And even though they had this big inheritance between, all, you know, Francis and her brothers, he wasn't allowed to control his own money. He was mm. kind of like given this meager allowance out of a fund. And he claimed that the Reverend was the one who, 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 you know, had the power to give him more money, but wouldn't. And he really disliked him. And this, this man, his name was Julius Balyog. He's this, this latter day witness that comes forth claims that, you know, Willie had found two local gang bangers and that they had paid these two hitmen to take care of it. And um, those were the people who killed Edward and, and Eleanor. These kind of two local thugs, one of whom ran a, a local speakeasy. They were just these no good, you know, gangster characters. And is um, everyone dead by now or are people still alive? Everyone's dead. You know, the last of the original of the main characters in the original story, Jim Mills was the last to go. He had died uh, a few years earlier, I think, in 1964. So there's 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 people there that are still alive that were, you know, involved in the story, but none of the central characters. So there's there are people that this detective can go and interview and question, but no one that was so directly related to the crime itself. So then what is the status of the case? I mean, it, is it solved? Is it not solved? I think that it's a question of who you ask. Um, I think that, you know, and if, and if you read the book, I think that anyone who reads the book, based on everything I lay out, you know, about this, this, this last twist in the story and some of the theories about the case, I think that you can draw a, a pretty firm conclusion on who you think might have done it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of people would be drawn to the conclusion that Francis and her brothers had something to do with this. That's that's the conclusion that that I come to, because, you know, there's even though there's there's no smoking gun, there's no concrete forensic evidence. It's it's very complicated. It's a lot of things that are still bewildering about the case. Um, it just seems like that's where all the smoke was. Um, mm -hmm. And there had to have been some, some fire there. And I do think that this this witness is. Um, story is is compelling and the fact that some little pieces of it you know found corroboration is interesting and compelling um but officially this is an unsolved mystery and i think to me that's what i i, I love about it i think that's what why it, it endures why it's so fascinating to this day because we want to know and we cannot know i think this is why you know we are still fascinated by jack the ripper and you know, stories like Amelia Earhart, we, you know, we, there's, you can get so close to a really strong theory, um, a, a real belief in what you think happened, but you, but you cannot know. And we still do not know to this day, you know, who killed the minister and the choir singer. Um, but to me, that gives the whole story a lot of mystique and, and power. As you were researching this, um, you know, and it's always so fascinating to go through either people's notes, if you had access to anyone's notes or what parts of the court record existed or police records. Was there something like fascinating in that process? The fascinating thing to me about the records that I was able to work with was, you know, during my research, this trove of records actually materialized, which was the original uh, uh, thousands of pages of original witness statements and depositions from 1922 and 1926. Also the original grand jury testimony, Fabulous. Um, a transcript of the original grand jury testimony. Um, and just to hear some of the people like in their own words interviewed like days after the murders were committed, you know, to, to, to hear that the two youths who found the body, like describe their exact movements and what they saw and what they felt in the moment. I mean, that was just fascinating to get a really visceral sense of what. It, or even just things like for the narrative purposes, like how a character moved or reacted or what they said. I mean, it was like, it was, it was really a visceral window into, you know, how, how the, the, the case initially unfolded in, in the early days. And that to me was just, you know, it was such rich, it was, it was, it was treasure to find those records really. Oh, I bet. I bet. And is there anything that you were looking for that you never found that you're so sorry that you're like, where is that? I really hope I find this someday. I mean, it's funny because it, it was these very records I'm talking about. You know, I went to the prosecutor's office in Somerset County, which still has 
its archive of all their records from the case. And it has the physical evidence. I was actually able to hold, you know, some of the clothing that they were murdered in. I held, I held the glasses that the Reverend was, was oh. murdered in. I held his church keys. I held the pig woman's day calendar, which became a, a key piece of evidence. When I was asking this, the, the evidence custodian, I said, well, where I'd love to, I see this list of like all these witness statements and, and you know, a list of depositions and, but like, where are the actual, you know, where are the actual statements? And he's like, you know, his, he was like, I, you know, they've probably been like destroyed a long time ago. And I kind of like resigned myself to that. And I'm like, I'm just going to work with what I have from the newspapers or this and that. And then they turned up. I mean, that was literally the thing <laughs> I was searching for. And in this, you know, miraculous twist, I found it. How did it turn up? <laughs> so there is, this is a great story in and of itself, but there is an old a guy in his 90s, this guy named George Wilson, he was this old New Brunswick resident, and he was cleaning out his basement. His wife has just died, and he calls up He calls up like an archivist, some archivist from the local library and from a Rutgers library, Rutgers University library. He says, you want to go through my basement? I have all this, this junk down there. And they, they go. He, he's I, I have some stuff that you might be interested in. And most of it's like, as they told me, it was like paintings or porcelain or things like that. And this uh, archivist from the new, from the New Brunswick public library sees this box in a, in a corner and she's like, Oh, what's that? And she opens it up and she looks and it's these records from the Hall Mills case. This is just in, in 2019. Um, wow. And she, she takes them and she goes through them and catalogs them. And then they, they create a new collection at the library called the Hall Mills murder case collection. And I discovered this as I was, as I was like, very far along in the proposal, the book proposal process. So I didn't even include this stuff in the proposal, but I immediately, as soon as I could, that summer of 2019 went down there and just started rifling through it. And this, I, I talked to the guy who had the records and he told me that his wife and him, were they, they, they were these interesting characters. They were interested in history. They lived next to some woman who was a secretary for a law firm. And that law firm was moving offices. And she said, you know, my boss is throwing out all this stuff. I have these court records from uh, the Hall Mills case. It must have been a lawyer who had worked on the case years earlier or something. And she said, do you want them? We're just going to throw them out. And they said, sure. And they took them and they were basically like sitting in his basement for many, <laughs> for many years and in quite good condition, too. That's incredible. See, I love stuff like that. That to me is like the it's 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 the puzzle. It's the treasure hunt. It's the searching and searching, you know, and then finding things in the most in the places you would never expect. Yeah. I mean, I wish I had found them myself, I guess that would have been the only more thrilling. Um, right. Thing about about this. But but I, I, I love that 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 to me is uh, it sounds like it was an incredible process for you. Mm -hmm. And um, absolutely. And and to me, as as a reporter uh, who loves to write, I that as much as I love this case, I really want to talk to you again about the process and what this was like because I I can't imagine anything more exhilarating. No, totally. And even just aside from some of the um, you know primary source documents like that, even just going through, I have a stack of like old detective magazines from the 1930s. I you know I plumbed the archives you know to develop the tabloid part of the story about the, the creation of the tabloid newspapers. I dug through the archives of the old trade press of the day, editor and publisher. And, you know, magazines like The New Yorker, they have great articles from from um, the 1920s about the case. There's just the whole, you know, the whole altogether, it's a trove um, of just like amazing um, escapist research that, you know, carried me into many, many late nights. Wow. Um, do you feel like you're done or do you feel like, do you still work on it? Even though your book is done, are you done with this case? I don't think I'm done with the case because I'd still, you know, I'd like to see what, if the book, you know, maybe shakes the trees a little bit, who, you know, I, I, I did a reading, one of the events I did, um, uh, this couple came, this, this brother and sister showed up and they said, you know, we're the, we're the great grandchildren of detective Ferd David. He was one of the one of the main detectives on the case. There's a lot of people like that. Um, that I've encountered, some of, some of whom I spoke to the book, people who are descended from some kind of like periphery character, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, everyone has an interest and a theory or, or, or what. So I mean, you, you do wonder if there could be something that materializes or some descendant of, of someone who comes forward with some interesting piece of information. But I just love hearing from uh, people who do have some tie to this case still. And, and I've, you know, um, you know, encountered some, some ones uh, even since the book's been published. And I hope to to you know, do more of that. Um, and, you know, hopefully this will, maybe we can, 
find a good home for this um, on film or television uh, or in, in, in podcasting. We'll see. Um, but, you know, I, I will continue to be a student of this crime, I think, for for years to come. Well, I mean, I think you've just got you have so much there. And I, and also that whole, as I always say, that whole process part of it that I find fascinating on how people figure things out, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, the red flags, the inconsistencies, the stories that were like, really, you confess to this? Really? <laughs> it's just it's some of it's ludicrous. Um, wow. I, I thank you so much, Joe, for coming on the podcast. Um, I could listen to you for hours. You should yeah. do... Uh, are you doing your audio book? I was like, I could listen to you for hours talking. Well, about you won't hear my voice. You'll hear uh, a guy named Robert Petkoff who has a much better voice. Um, and he reads the story in a very, very dramatic and crisp way. So I would recommend it if you, if you want more, uh, <laughs> if you want to hear it told. Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of audiobooks these days. It's really funny. I switched during the pandemic. I'm just obsessed with audiobooks constantly. I just I, I love it now. Um and I'm and I'm very sensitive to the narrator. It's like, oh, I don't like that narrator. <laughs> well, he, has a, he has a better voice than me. So um <laughs> so go 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 to Audible or Amazon, wherever you get your, your audiobooks. So we want to remind everyone that the name of the book is called Blood and Ink, the Scandalous Jazz Age Double Murder That Hooked america on true crime joe it's been such a pleasure where can people follow you um either on social media or you know just keep keep up with you yeah i mean the best way you know to to follow me specifically um for you know kind of bonus material or updates on the book or my appearances go to my i have a substack newsletter just go to joepompeo.substack.com you can subscribe to my newsletter i also kind of give updates and recommendations on um, you know, other works in the genre of historical true crime and historic narrative nonfiction. Um, I'm also on Twitter where you might find more of my Vanity Fair articles, but that's at Joe Pompeo um, on Twitter. And my website, you know, if you just go to bloodend.inc, um, that'll take you to pretty much, you know, you could find all of my, my, my social feeds there. Terrific. Um, Y'all can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. Um, we are just, thank you, Joe. Joe, this has been the most fun I've had in a long time. Um, I, hope, so, I hope it wasn't too complicated. I know it, it gets uh, it gets it, into the it weeds, was but. complicated, but that's the whole <laughs> point. That's the point of this story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hopefully, everyone could follow along. Um, you can find this episode and all of our podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, True Crime Daily. Receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Um, until next time, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, even on a special episode of <laughs> True Crime Daily, the podcast, don't do crime.